So, I, I didn't expect to give this talk. Dennis told me on the airplane I was giving this talk. But then he's supposed to help. So we'll see. Um, I'm going to put a diagram on the board. Remember the, in the previous talk, there's a big diagram of ordinary differential cohomology. So now I'll put up another diagram which will stay for the duration of the talk. And uh, this is very fat chalk, I have to say. Well, let's see what happens. Okay, so we, we, I'm going to use this whole board for this diagram. And in the middle, I'll put K hat. And up here, I'll put K even. And down here, I'll put wedge B G L. And over here, I'll put H even coefficients, complex coefficients. And over here, I'll put K odd. C mod Z, whatever that is. And here I'll put wedge odd modulo wedge GL. And finally over here I'll put H odd with complex coefficients. And then we'll put a lot of arrows. Gonna put the zero? I'm going to put the zeros. Up here is a zero. Down here there's a zero. See, that's why I need the whole board. Down here there's a zero. And up here, there's a zero. And this goes here. And this goes here. And then I'll label some of these things will look familiar. Some of them won't. It looks that's Chish. That's a delta. This is a Bockstein. Uh, this is Duram. It's a Duram map. This is a Duram map. Uh, this is just mod mod Z. Uh, this is I, and this is J. So the rest of the talk will be what? Oh, what? K even. K even. What about it? I'll put an arrow. The main one above the arrow. K even to H even. K. Oh, oh yeah. I didn't label that. Oh yeah. Uh, I forgot what I call it here. No. This is this is. Uh, oh yeah. I guess this is Cha too. Well, it's. It's kind of uh, tensor with C, isn't it? How do you do this map? Well, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a sort of a tra. So the rest, so I'll put this up here. You can ponder it. And we'll, we'll say what things are. But what's in the middle is differential cohomology with respect to K theory. So before it was ordinary cohomology up in the upper right, ordinary integral cohomology. Now it's K theory in the upper right. These are various types of differential forms. 
That's odd C mod K theory with coefficients in C mod Z. The box 9 is a familiar name. And so what is all this about? This is a functor in the middle. And I think that this functor is also uniquely characterized by this diagram. There's no other such functor k hat which satisfies all this stuff. So, <coughs> okay. So, uh, and that's a theorem of Lukey and Schick. That's a non trivial theorem. That's a non trivial theorem. That's right. Because k odd is not so, it's not characterized by the diagram. K hat odd. K hat odd is not. That is true. There's a diagram for with K odd up there and a nice construction in the middle, but it's not uniquely characterized by the diagram. So uh, anyway. So so I want to give the notion of what we call a structured bundle. So these this, these things in the middle are all vector bundles with extra structure. So if I have a complex vector bundle with connection uh, V and a connection which we'll call del uh, over X, uh, we'll let R uh, contained in wedge 2 of uh, X uh, and endomorphisms of V uh, is the curvature. Uh, and that's uh, the notation. I'm going to define CH of del, which is the churn character in terms of differential forms. So it's summing on J. 1 over j factorial, 1 over 2 pi i to the jth power times the trace of r wedge, wedge r j times. And that's an element, it's a closed form in wedge even of x with complex coefficients. Okay, so this is the uh, the Ve homomorphism applied to uh, these invariant polynomials, the trace powers. You sum them up, you get a form, and this represents the churn character. This is a rational. It's a rational cohomology class. Complex coefficients. A v is a complex bundle. You said. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't say it, but I should have. <laughs> v is a complex vector bundle. Complex vector bundle. Delta is a complex linear connection. And this is a connection, right? This is a connection. This is a complex vector bundle. This is the churn character. And now, if I have a, a closed curve, uh, uh, sorry, not a, a curve of connections. Well, suppose I have two connections. So I have delta 0 and delta 1. And a curve connecting them, gamma of t equals, let's say, delta up a t. Uh, I can say that a t, a up a t, equals delta t prime. So you take a derivative of this family of connections, and that's an element in wedge 1 of x with coefficients in endomorphisms of v. So when you, when you, when you differentiate a connection, a family of connections, you get one of these. Some of these symbols are going to look like the symbols that Fede have talked about before. So it's vaguely familiar. Uh, then there's something. So I want to see 
there's a, there's a difference uh, function. Uh, I hope you guys can, can see this. Uh, it depends, it looks like it depends on this curve, so we'll call it CS of gamma, and that equals the integral from zero to one of the sum on J from J equals to one, starts at one, of one over J minus one factorial, 1 over 2 pi i to the j times the trace, this time, of a up a t, so remember I'm integrating this thing, wedge rt, wedge rt, and this is j minus 1 times. And this is contained in wedge odd of uh, x coefficients in C. So, so here's a form, r up a t is the curvature of the teeth connection. And it varies, and a up a t we've just defined. And so... Can I ask a question? Yes? So, if you looked at the formula for cha of the connection. Cha, yeah. And then if you imagine that depending on t, if you dif just differentiated that, would you get that expression? Uh, no. Because r is dA plus a squared. And yeah, but you'd see, you'd, you'd, the t would distribute among all these things. Where here, it's there everywhere. Yeah, but you differentiate the product. You get like a derivation. Yeah, but you'd... And the trace means you can cyclically permute, so you can move the gate in front. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. All right. No, because you have to take D of this. The, 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 uh, if you just differentiated this, you wouldn't get something that... Oh, I see. It, 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 it ain't going to work. Right. One thing, it changes dimension. Right. So, so here, here is... So... This is, a, this is a term that connects the two characteristic forms, so if I take the differential of Cs of gamma, this is sort of dependent on Cs of gamma, I'm going to get D of that is going to be the churn character of delta 1 minus the churn character of delta 0. Well, how can I think of that, CS again? How can you think of it? Yeah. You just wrote a formula down. I hate formulae. Well, ideas. I'm having jet lag. <laughs> well, one way to think of it is if you got the churn form by a map into the classifying space, and in the classifying space, there is this churn character. And if you had a one parameter, if you had a curve of such maps, and you took the interior product, the, the interior product of the churn character over there, interior product with the parameter field of the map, uh, and integrated that, uh, I think you'd get this. That's a, a way of like thinking of it. Chain right. Okay. That's right. So, uh, such a formula is, is obviously not surprising because these two things are cohomologous. This gives a particular formula. It seemed to depend on gamma, but actually, uh, a good fact is that if gamma bar was another such curve, in fact, gamma bar, another curve, then um, uh, right, CS of gamma hat, gamma bar, this curve, 
equals CS of gamma plus exact, plus something exact, okay? So therefore, I can just define, now I can leave out the curves, and I can define CS uh, of the pair of connections uh, uh, equals, let's say, CS of gamma modulo exact. <coughs> what? <coughs> it's a theorem. But it's, it, a fact means a, th a small theorem. Okay. It's a relatively unimportant theorem, but useful. Okay. So this is a useful, maybe I could have said useful lemma, whatever. Exact. It means, so CS of delta zero, delta one, is now an element in wedge odd modulo wedge odd exact. Exact differential forms, that's what exact means, okay? So this is now well a well-defined object in this space. You, we forget about exact forms, don't worry about them. And uh, it's just a total odd form, modulo exact. So, uh, so that's well defined. And here's a, a, a nice fact, another fact about it, that if I take CS of delta zero, delta one, and I add that to CS of delta one, delta two, that is actually equal, remember working mod exact, that's actually equal to CS of delta zero, delta two. Okay, so you go from this connection to this one, and you can go via this one in the middle, and, and you'll, get, you'll get the right thing. And that means that this, we're gonna get an equivalence relation So, uh, so we can we can say uh, delta zero is equivalent to delta one if C S of delta zero delta one now equals zero because remember this is mod exact and is an equivalence relation. So, because of this, it satisfies the, the uh, this equivalent. A anyway, that's clear. If and only if. What? If and only if. If, 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 if and only if what? The definition, that's the, true, if and only if. This is the definition. If and only if. Right. People like to write definition. All right, I put in an extra all F. All right, all right, all right, all right. Anyway, this is a definition of two equivalent, connect, of equi being equivalent, and so I'm going to define a structured bundle. Can I, I think it's, can I, it's very worth saying two things are equivalent, they actually have not only the same characteristic classes, but they have the same characteristic forms. I'll get to that. I will get to that, but it's true. They have the same characteristic. So I want to define a structured bundle. Structured bundle. Uh, and this is equal to a pair, V equals a vector bundle together with an equivalence class of connections. So that's a structured bundle. It's a vector bundle. It doesn't have a particular connection, but it has this family of connections, and that's good enough for many 
purposes. And because of up there. this formula up here, uh, that uh, uh, the differential of CS is that, and those two things would differ exact. So, so uh, ch of V contained in wedge two, no, wedge even of X coefficients in C is well defined. So if two connections are equivalent, they have the same churn character and uh, as differential forms. As, dif as differential forms, yeah. Same churn character. So chush is now a thing, and there you see that chush up there. It's the same chush. It's the same chush. Okay. Ah. One question. So, a priori, you could have required just just the equality of uh, shared forms, but you, you impose a stronger condition, right? So, yes. it's, it's equivalence is a stronger condition. It's equivalence is a stronger condition than the churn forms are equal. Yes, mm -hmm. and it's and that's really an important point. And it's, it's going to be a better condition, right? Because so your diagram will work because because it's a, it's a better condition. Exactly. So, exactly. Uh, but if I just said they're equivalent, if the churn characters, churn forms are equivalent, it would not have been a very interesting, uh, it would not have been very interesting. Um, so, uh, but this is interesting. Uh, it's, it's obviously more subtle. Uh, now let's see. Next thing to do is a ray. Yep. Last comment you made. Yeah. I mean, saying that churn forms are equal is specifying infinitely many parameters, right? Obviously, it's, it's a form. And this extra precision is, in usual cases, is adding only finally many additional parameters. However, it makes the mathematics work correctly. Like there's going to be a marvelous torus property that doesn't hold if you put this equivalence relation, but it does hold with this thing, things like that. There's yeah. only finally many more parameters. So but it's the correct thing to do. When, when Dennis and I, so this is uh, work that Dennis and I did, and, uh, and we were searching for a candidate for this guy in the middle. And it, it, we said, oh yeah, well, the churn forms should be the same uh, if we're gonna use bundles, but that just wasn't, it just didn't work. It wasn't enough. And then, oh yeah, well something, we have to say something about the connections, and this is like the minimal thing you can say about the connections that makes this thing work. So, so let's see. We can go a little bit further here. So we have these, we have these structured bundles now, and they, you can take a direct sum of two connections on the direct sum of bundles. You can take the tensor product of two connections on the tensor product of bundles. And that all makes sense. It, it carries through with this equivalence uh, so that we can really talk about V direct sum W or V tensor W if V and W are two structured bundles. Obviously, you take the direct sum of the bundles, you take the direct sum connection, and over here you take the tensor product of the bundles and the tensor product of the connections, and 
the uh, equivalence holds. So that this uh, two things are, well, you, can, you see what you need. This all makes sense. And so now, and as I, as Dennis pointed out, shush, oh, did I write it already? Yes, I've already written it, it's well defined. So now, I'm going to define something called struct x. So struct x equals the abelian semigroup with distributed distributive uh, multiplication. <laughs> what? Like a semi-ring, I guess. I don't know what you call it. An abelian semi-ring? A semi-ring? Can you say that? You could say it, but I don't know if it's, a, it's, a, if it's an official definition. Oh, but the distributive multiplication. Okay. Anyway, it's abelian as a semigroup, and it has a distributive multiplication. And, uh, yeah, with commutative distributive multiplication. So anyway, it's an abelian semigroup with that stuff. And, and I want to look at isomorphism classes. So it's the ability of isomorphism classes. Of structured bundles. So, if you read the T as book on K theory, it talks about vect X. Mm -hmm. The same thing. Uh, so this is copying his. Uh, yeah. James copying his. Mm -hmm. Right. X, right? Yep. Remember that? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. You've got vect X. So, K, you remember, you make vect X, which is the isomorphism classes of vector bundles. Honest bundles, forgetting about connection, that's vect. And then you apply the growth of deconstruction and you get k of x. You apply that to vect. And here, obviously, we're going to apply the growth of deconstruction to struct. And, but it, it's a little more, uh, it's, a, it's a little more work. Uh, so, um, Here's something that's analogous to ordinary vector bundles. Well, if I take if I take uh, All right, so I'll make it that. Oh, all right. Definition. A connection is called flat if holonomy hall on all me is trivial. It's actually uh, it's actually uh, v. This pair is called flat if it has trivial holonomy, and that means the bundle is trivial as a bundle, and uh, the curvature zero. So it me implies. V trivial curvature vanishes. And so we'll call. Can I make a comment? People, people usually write little f l a t, and that means the curvature, curvature vanishes. Zero, which means it's a flat bundle. So he means the global holonomy as well as zero. So it's capital F. So 
Right. So not right. only is the bundle trivial, but it's a trivial connection. Is that it's as trivial as you can get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, flat, capital F. Mm -hmm. it's, a cap, it's a capital flat. I flat mean, it's, it's flat as can be. Uh, boring, so bo boring as can be. And so we'll call, uh, we'll call V contained in, in uh, let's say V represented by V and uh, a family here. We'll call that flat. If some Dell connection contained in, in here is flat. flat. So we'll have flat objects in here. And now here's a nice uh, fact which I'm going to dignify with the name of a theorem. Yeah? So in this last definition, uh, the bundle itself is it's trivial. It's trivial. Correct. Uh, I mean, Bundle's trivial. No, no, no. In the very uh, bottom line, the bundle, is it trivial? Yeah, the bundle is yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Cis bundle. I, if right. Yeah. I, I should have put. the word is. When you say a bundle is trivial, that's not a very good sentence. A bundle is that that can be given with an isomorphism to a trivial bundle. That's different from saying a bundle. When you say a bundle is trivial. It means it is the trivial bundle. Yeah. A bundle is isomorphic to trivial bundle. It's an abstract bundle, isomorphic. So flat bundles are these abstract bundles with given isomorphism to the trivial bundle. Right. I mean, I mean okay, okay. because he's working, he's building a set out of this right. collection of objects. So. Right. Now, any two uh, such flat guys Uh, of uh, of dimension n are isomorphic. So a guy is an element struct. Right. Guy is an element struct, but they're all isomorphic if you have a dimension n. So. Uh, we're going to, so n is the only thing important, so we'll call uh, this, what do I call it here, n contained in struct is, uh, this, I mean, it's an element of struct, it is that guy, that element. Okay, so now, so here's a theorem. Given V contained in struct can find W contained in struct such that V plus or direct sum W equals N for sum N. So this is exactly the same statement for ordinary vector bundles. There's always an inverse. You can always find some inverse. It's not unique, but there it is. Now, the proof of this. The question is yes. about the notation. Yeah. N 
this n in brackets. I suppose it is n-dimensional vector bundle, uh, n-dimensional vector bundle, trivial, with trivial uh, connection. It's trivial. It, 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 it's one of this isomorphism class of trivial n-dimensional bundles. The first three lines give a correct statement of what that means. Yeah. So, now this theorem is, is uh, not trivial to prove. And in fact, the proof that we gave in our paper uh, really only worked the way we gave it for Hermitian vector bundles where the, Hermit, where the structure group was a unitary group rather than the full linear group. Uh, because, uh, well, anyway, uh, but it's nonetheless true. And it, uh, Leon, sitting right over here, found our error, regrettably after the paper was published, and uh, found a shortcut, uh, fixed it. So, um, but this is, this is true. And, um, and it's very useful uh, in here. Uh, uh, uh. Well, I think the better, maybe a slightly better from it, Leon was doing a kind of a holomorphic analog of this theory, found a different proof, and then he noticed that this also helped correct the inadequacy in our. Well, he pointed out the inadequacy. He found the inadequacy and then solved it at the same time. It's, it, it was kind of a, a subtle. Point Nara Nara Sinham and uh, and who who's the other guy? Ramana. No, 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 no. Ramana and Nara Seaman proved years ago that all bundles with connection with any group and so on uh, could be uh, gotten from a classifying bundle. And with vector bundles, but traditional classifying bundles, uh, those over the uh, the Grassmannian. And that classifies all vector bundles. Well, that's the classifying space, is the Grassmannian, uh, different Grassmannians. Uh, and that turns out to be, and, th and they all have canonical connections, actually, and it turns out to be that classifies bundles with connection where they are uh, unitary, when they have a unitary connection. It does not seem to classify bundles with connection uh, uh, when, uh, oh, well, they don't know. Uh, there is a classifying bundle, but it's not necessarily that one. It's not necessarily that one. And I had misread the, uh, the theorem, uh, thinking it was always that one, and using that bundle which, which comes equipped with an inverse, uh, the, uh, comes equipped with an inverse, uh, the bundle is everything in the plane or in the, in the subspace point of the thing, and the other bundle is the vectors in the orthogonal subspace. So uh, it always came equipped with a nice inverse. So anyway, but this theorem is true in general, and it now is completely analogous to the comparable theory theorem in K theory. Okay. So. Say it again. Could we speak uh, now about structure groups? Like for ordinary bundles, the structure group is unitary. Well, not ordinary. If if we were talking unitary here then uh, I wouldn't have needed Leon. <laughs> but, uh, but this is the general linear group. We're just doing the general linear group. Ah. If one was doing the unitary group, all the C's would turn into R's, OK? And the, and the theorem is perfectly true if you restrict yourself to Hermitian vector bundles, the unitary group, and so on. Then there's just R's up there instead of C's. and uh, well, it's also uh, very nice. Uh, it's, very, it, it's, really, it's really very good. But if you want to go to C, then uh, it's, a little more, it's a little bit more subtle. It's kind of useful, I think, in algebra and maybe number theory to use C. 
some of there's some connection yeah. with those I mean, areas. Might as well. The unitary theory doesn't quite. Yeah. You might as well. All right. So uh, uh, I haven't said anything yet. Oh, but I need this. So now we're going to just set k hat, which I, which I said. So we'll just set k hat, k hat of x equals the commutative ring. So you don't have to say semi ring anymore. Commutative ring obtained from struct. Struct of X using the growth and peak. And uh, this is the point of the talk. Can you bear down on the k hat of x? It's invisible to me. This k hat is invisible. Yeah. Well, is that more visible? Yeah. It's the product. The problem is the water. Right. Yeah. No, but I mean, just, just do it again. Okay, it's kind of emerging now. I can see it. X. Is there anyone beside Dennis who could not read that K hat? I can't see it. No, no, you don't count. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, that's what that is. Um, and then that's the K hat up there. That's the K hat up there. Now I want to define uh, wedge. BG, see, wedge BGL. So, so wedge BGL uh, is uh, of X equals. Uh, all forms, all closed forms even forms representing churn characters of vector bundles over X. Okay? So, the, these are all closed forms and these are a ring because the churn classes multiply. We have two vector bundles. So it doesn't necessarily say they all come from connections, although it turns out they do. But uh, that's what this is. And of course, this map here takes you into there because it's come from some vector bundle inside there. The map del, of course, is just forget the connection. So that's an easy map. You got this pair, isomorphism class, forget the connection, and you get there. Car ca calculate the churn character you get in here. And the fact that 
this thing commutes is uh, obvious. So, so there's a question. Yeah, so, so this lambda BJL, you say it's a ring, but it's, 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 it's not a vector space, right? No, it is a vector space. Oh, it is a vector space? Yeah, because the, the direct sum. But if you, or, 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 or which coefficients? Say it again. Uh, or, or complex? Complex coefficients, yeah. Or complex, is it? Yeah, vector space. What is the jump character, uh, uh, the defined jump character is additive? Yeah, the churn character is additive and it's multiplicative, so that's okay. Well, that's a good question, because usually characters are classical aren't additive. That's the whole point of the churn character, it makes it additive. Right. Right. The churn, the total churn class of a direct sum, you have to multiply. But the churn character, so the total churn class is an integral class. Integral. Churn character has these coefficients and it's additive. It's a log, I guess, or something. It's a mysterious, right? We don't know exactly what it is, right? You just you define it as a, all forms coming from chain characters, but it's intrinsic. What? This, this uh, space here? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's that's a mysterious right. object. Right? It is, but another way to look at it is all forms that you get from stabilizing. Well, from mapping into the big classifying space, uh, from mapping into the classifying space uh, and pulling back those canonical forms. Um, it, it's a little mysterious, but, uh, but there it is. And uh, it's a perfectly good thing. It's not mysterious. It's all, I mean, you just said it. They all come from connections on stabilized bundles. Yeah. So they're all churn character forms of all connections on all bundles. Right. Right, but are they all forms integral? Or? What? Are they all forms closed even? It's a Hodge conjecture right in here. A complete description of I don't this. understand the... Complete description of this space would be a Hodge conjecture. No. For complex manifold. The image, if you know, the image of all chain character magic. Maybe for a complex manifold, but... Complex manifold is a Hodge conjecture. Complete description of this space. Oh, I know what he's saying. I know what he's saying. It's not mysterious because... Oh, that's going to come up in my talk. I'm going to give another formulation of this, and I'm going to say lambda BGL in terms of a topological condition. Well, they characterize it. It's the integrality condition given by the Atiyah Singer So, ah, so I, I see his point. Ah, see, which cohomology classes are churn right. characters of bundles? That's, that's, that's the, the, the yeah, topologists that's have solved that. That's known from the 60s. And I'll mention it. <coughs> okay, fine. So, this is right. I forgot what you meant. I just define it as it's coming from bundles. Right. And Dennis will characterize these things coming from bundles. Uh, by some integrality. All right, so there's one more thing and, and then I'm, I'm pretty well done. Uh, pretty well done. Uh, I, I want to uh, go back to... Wait, so you're saying hey hat is a find your fits in there and everything, yeah. Yeah. everything is defined now? Uh, yeah, but, uh, no, this isn't. Wedge GL is not defined. Okay. So I want to define wedge GL. And uh, wedge GL will be kind of familiar. So we go back to the group GLN. We go back to the group GLN. And uh, so we have we have GLN C. Uh, and on GLN C there's a canonical Lie algebra valued one form. Oh, thank you. So, uh, theta contained in wedge one 
of GL and C with coefficients in its Lie algebra that I'm just going to write that. Uh, gosh, anyway, you know the Lie algebra of this is this. Uh, there's a canonical form. It just says take a tangent vector at the identity that is an element of the Lie algebra. You push it around, it's a one form with values in the Lie algebra, left invariant one form with values in the Lie algebra. That's little theta. And then <coughs> we take, we define some great big thing, capital theta. Uh, and I'll give you a motivation for it in a second. So it's sum from j equals 1 bj, whatever that is, of a trace of theta wedge wedge theta uh, 2j minus 1 times. They're all odd forms. Uh, okay. Uh, that's contained in wedge odd of uh, GL and C, uh, where BJ is a crazy number. Uh, it's 1 over J minus 1 factorial times 1 over 2 pi to the jth power times some number which is best written as the integral from 0 to 1 of t squared minus t to the j minus 1 power dt. I always, I tried to simplify this somehow, but anyway, that, that's the coefficients. And really, this total form which represents a cohomology class in the group is the transgression of the uh, Chern class. And so... Not the Chern character. Churn character. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Of a churn character. So if you if you use the, the churn ve homomorphism, you may remember from yesterday, you have this invariant polynomial, these trace powers, those invariant polynomials in that Lie algebra, that generates all the invariant polynomials. <coughs> And if you take this particular one, upstairs it's exact, it's d of something, you take that something of which it's d upstairs, you restrict to the fiber, and you get this. And, and that's the transgression activity. And this is a, uh, this is a nice thing. Now, uh, and, and so wedge GL, so now, wedge GL of X equals G star of this guy uh, big theta uh, plus okay plus wedge odd exact where G here, G maps X into G, L, and C, all such G's. So, you map X into the group, you pull back this form under that value, you do that for all possible maps of the manifold into the group. And then, for good measure, you throw in everything exact. In fact, I've often wondered if you can get all those exact things from maps into the group. But 
but it doesn't matter. Uh, there it is. So this is wedge GLN. And so what's the motivation for defining this? Well, it's the following. And it, it's, a, it's kind of a nice fact. So I'll just say it. So suppose you have a flat bundle and it has two isomorphic connections huh? that you get from a, well, like, a, uh, like a gauge transformation. You just transform everything, you get another connection. They're both flat. But they're not equivalent. When you take CS of a pair of isomorphic connections, the CS term is, does not, in general, zero. That is to say, that form is not exact. But it's exact plus one of these, one of, uh, one of these guys. So isomorphic connections are not necessarily equivalent even if they're the trivi in the trivial bundle. In any event, they're not equivalent, but they're almost equivalent. Instead of CS being exact and therefore zero, it gets perturbed by, uh, by, by, by this map. So notice if you have at least a flat bundle and you have two connections, <coughs> one relates to the other. They're isomorphic, so there's a map from the base into the group. You can, you can do that. So. Uh, that's why we define uh, the, uh, this guy here. Uh, you need that. Now. Can I, can I add to this? Because I'm yes. sure this was a little confusing. And in fact, it's going to be very important in the next half. Because so this, in fact, we argued about this for years. Uh, there's an, in modern mathematics now, we're moving from set theory to category theory, essentially. And one has to distinguish between the word equivalent and equivalence. Oh. There's a difference between two things being equivalent and choosing an equivalence between two things. So he's just made that distinction. Two flat bundles are equivalent, but the equivalence may change things. Yeah. So there's the idea of a structure on a given bundle. You can deform it to an exact term time and its equivalence, and that's an element of struct, but you can have an isomorphism with an automorphism that changes the equivalence class. Yeah, it changes the equivalence class. But it doesn't change it by much. So, so you have to allow this, this extra thing. So, I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. And I'll finish over here. And then we'll go back and look at the diagram again. So, so. We'll call uh, V contained in struct or stably trivial. Uh, um, that, that, that means that there's a V direct sum something flat equals something else flat. That's what it means. You can add a flat element of struct and the sum will be that. That's stably flat or stably, maybe flat is what I meant, stably flat. And here's the thing. If V is stably flat, you can construct, which I'm going to call capital, I'm going to call it CS hat, 
of V as an element of wedge odd modulo wedge GL. Modulo wedge GL. So, so now I, I didn't have to take two guys if this thing was stably flat to get a CS term. I can get sort of a CS term if I'll allow some ang ambiguity by just one connection. Because if I took a second connection on this sta stably flat, see remember GL contains all uh, exact things too. So uh, because it's stably flat, suppose it was uh, actually flat. And I take a connection, I take another one, they're related by a G, map into the group, and I'm going to get something in here when I take, uh, when I take uh, the CS term. So if I want to forget about these things, I can actually do this for all stable facts. So this is, uh, and, uh, and, and here is another fact which is pretty important. In fact, it's very important. That this map, CS hat, you know, I, there's something wrong. This B plus F, I think that's some connection on the trivial bundle, but not the trivial bundle. Trivial connection on the trivial bundle. So you're saying, if you're saying that stably, because you're trying to characterize the what goes to zero in K theory, right? Yeah. So you, that just means there's some connection on the trivial bundle, which when you add it into your given structure bundle, gives you the flat guy. That's right. That's right. But you wrote B plus flat equals flat. Yeah. Isn't that B I, plus some connection on the trivial bundle is flat? See, no, no, notice that this is the kernel. I mean, these things, if I, if it was just bundles, this is the kernel in, in K theory. This, this goes to zero in K theory, ordinary K theory, right? Anything stably trivial, it's trivial, and it goes to zero. <coughs> I want to see what, what uh, the whole set of things that that go to. Uh, How uh, are you doing that? <sighs> yeah. See, any connection in the trivial bundle goes to zero. Yeah. Let me see. Did I write this down wrong? I want to look at the kernel of this. Yeah. And then I guess I mean, yes. Okay. I, I wrote this wrong. It's stably trivial. If if he is contained in struct, if, let's just put trivial over here. So, if you have a stably trivial bundle, then You can define this if it's stably trivial. You can you can define this by itself. Sp yeah, suppose it was trivial. Suppose it was trivial. Okay, this is how it works. Yeah. Let's just suppose it's trivial. It's a trivial bundle. It's not flat or anything. Some connection right, with some connection. So I pick a trivialization uh, and and uh, the connection. I fixed that. And now any other connection will give me a CS difference. 
But now I say, oh, well, suppose that I didn't, suppose I picked a different trivialization and a, and a trivial connection with respect to that. Then the CS term would be different, but it would only differ by the difference of those two gauge, flat things. Right. And therefore, if it's stably trivial, I can construct this. So forget the stably flat line. Forget the statement. If you have a bundle though. which is trivial and a connection on it, trivialize the bundle, take the CS term. If you change the trivialization, you change by lambda GM. Right. The CS term will change by lambda GM. Yes. Okay. So that's, you know, that's it. So, and, and in fact, I just sort of waved my hands and showed how you do it if the bundle is trivial, but that it works even if it's stably trivial as a bundle. Uh, bundle just one point. What? Suppose, uh, suppose I take a bundle over a point with yeah. uh, a non-trivial connection. A bundle over a point. All the connection will be trivial. All the connections will be All trivial. Yeah, well, that's po map of a point in the GLM. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then you're pulling back this odd form. There's, there's no, you can't differentiate nothing. But, but you Everything's collapsed. Map of a point. If you have a vector bundle over a point, the different isomorphism to the trivial bundle is GLM. But if I take so you have a map of a point and a GLM. Right. So it's consistent. All right. So, so here's, here's a fact. CS maps. The, the, the fact is that CS... Ah, I wrote it once. That CS uh, on the kernel delta. of delta into wedge odd GL <coughs> is an isomorphism. And so I make I, so I'm going to set the I above equal to CS hat inverse. Okay. Now this took some work, takes some work to prove. And again, it, it depends on that inverse construction. So the fact that this is true in the non-Hermitian case. Uh, again, we thank Leon. Again, we thank Leon. So uh, Leon, uh, I mean, the paper is published. No one knows that it's wrong. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, it has so that error. It still might be OK. Well, the theorems are correct. It's just that the proof is wrong. Uh, so, uh, so, the fact that this CS thing, you can, you can get an element in here, seems reasonable. If it's something that's trivial or stably, even stably trivial, okay, I can get this total form modulo these GL ones, well-defined. But it's kind of nice that everything in there gets the whole thing uh, slides right in to k hat. That no matter what odd form you take up to something in GL, there is in fact some bundle with that as its uh, as its CS term, some trivial bundle or stably trivial bundle with that as its CS term, and and that since this is full and because this is closed anyway, it doesn't matter under D. It shows that every form over here arises as a characteristic form. Every form that's homologically appropriate is the characteristic form of some bundle with connection. That was not obvious. What so, does it mean homologically appropriate? Say it again? What does it mean in this context homologically appropriate? That it's, that it's cohomology is that of a, of some, uh, 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 of the churn character of some vector bundle. Yeah. 
So it's homologically appropriate, co-homologically appropriate. That's what wedge. That's what wedge BGL is. Those are all those forms, appropriate forms. Everyone comes. So, but the map chush is onto. They all get hit. And the fact that chush is onto comes from the fact that this uh, covers everything. Obviously, chush is onto, cohomologically it's onto this, but that every form shows up means that you could add D of anything, and it still you'd add something exact, and that's because this all fits in there and therefore goes over there. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, there's a lot of details, obviously, uh, but this is a representation, a model for uh, 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 k-hat. It's a model for differential k-theory. There are other models. Turns out they're by Bunke and Stieck, a German pair. They are all isomorphic, so there's only one actual functor up to isomorphism. But there's a number of ways to see this. And notice, this is very different from differential characters. Differential characters were functions on cycles and so on and so forth. This is equivalence classes of connections. Uh, really different. Now Dennis is going to talk about how actually you could make a model for k hat in terms of functions on cycles. And uh, so I, I guess we'll stop and then we'll come back and, and we'll Thank you very much. listen to that. Okay. So I, th I think Jim's talk yesterday started with, he was trying to compute the first Pontryagin class divided by three in a combinatorial manner because that gives the signature. And th that means the integral of the first Pontryagin form divided by three over the manifold, four manifold, is an integer because it computes the signature of, of the homology, the middle uh, intersection homology, so it's an integer. So this quantity is an integer, and in fact, this would have been known to Pontryagin, uh, or, or Pontryagin defined these classes, and uh, probably Rockland uh, proved that it had, that it was given by the signature. Then, uh, turns out, <coughs> that's if you have a smooth manifold, but there are three other kinds of manifolds that can come into play besides smooth manifolds. Uh, you can have spin manifolds, uh, almost complex manifolds, or stably almost complex manifolds. So when I refer to a C manifold, I mean a stably almost complex manifold, which means a stable tangent bundle has a complex structure. Or spin C, I'll say what that means effectively, not, I won't give the definition. But anyway, uh, uh, so there's, it turns out if, if the manifold is spin, then actually four manifold is spin, P1 over 24 is an integer. Uh, and in fact, there's a generalization to higher dimensional manifolds using a, something called the A hat genus. And this is always an integer. And the topologists uh, found this out. Adams bought, you know, Milner proved, bought proved the uh, bought periodicity theorem, and then Adams and Milner uh, uh, extracted the maximum information out of that and got that certain things are integers very in all dimensions. But already in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the late 50s, I think, Rockland found that actually P1 over 48 is an integer for four manifolds. And this turns out to be the significant fact that distinguish, huh? Four manifolds. And I'm only talking about P1. So to be an integer, you have to integrate. Yeah. And so in fact, this is this this the fact that this is an integer generalizes universally. And then there's an extra factor of two, Rockland discovered, which uh, later gave these interesting conditions that uh, whether 
to be a smooth four manifold is an extra subtle condition. And then Donaldson gave more conditions. His famous theory gave more. But Rock had already had the non first non-trivial condition. Anyway, so there's integrality issues that are quite subtle here. And so for these three kinds of manifolds, so if you take an even closed manifold and a vector bundle over it, complex vector bundle, say, or a spin bundle, or a, I haven't said what this is, I will in a minute, then you can form the Chern character, character co cohomology class or form, and then you can combine it with uh, an internal characteristic class of the manifold. So um, it could be the generalization of some of these things here. Anyway, and it was found by Adams, Bott, and Milner less than 1960 that these combinations gave integers. Then uh, I think uh, Gelfand independently raised the question of, uh, you know, the index of an elliptic operator is an integer. And if you deform the operator, this integer doesn't change. It varies continuously, so it doesn't change. So it's a topological invariant and how to compute it. So that's the famous Atiyah Singer index theorem where it's formulated and proved. And uh, in fact, the story of that theorem is sort of forgotten now, but actually the fact that these expressions were integers, which were proven by the topologists, meant if that's an integer, it should be the index of an operator. And so they, T and Singer invented the Dirac, they named it the Dirac operator, but they invented the Dirac operator in the full differential geometric context. And you need a spin structure to work over R. If you work over C, this other structure called spin C is enough to define a Dirac operator. And then the uh, solution space, uh, its formal dimension is the, uh, the integer in question given by this formula. And then the question that Leon asked last time about what is this uh, uh, Im image here? Well, uh, Jim said, well, this really only depends on the co the cohomology class being appropriate, it's closed form. So I'm gonna, abusing history, I'm gonna call this the Atiyah Singer space, okay? But it really should be the Bott, Milner, Adam space. But it's easier to remember if you think of it as the, it's more elegant. I'm gonna call this the Atiyah Singer space. And, uh, and so the statement is, here's a proposition, suppose you have an I'm going to say it in the stronger form. I could say it, a cohomology class is a churn character of a bundle if and only if. But I'm going to say, I'm going to combine it with what Jim said. So an even form on a manifold is the churn character form of some complex bundle if and only if for all even closed manifolds mapping into the base, when you pull back this form, this expression, see if you put in churn character of E, this would be an integer. So this, a necessary condition that this is an integer. So that's a sufficient condition. That's the theorem. So it's extremely beautiful. So in other words, the theorem is the form is a churn character, a, a character form if and only if it satisfies the well-known integrality conditions that are expressed by the Atiyah Singer index theorem. And the uh, integer in this case is the Dirac operator of the manifold with coefficients in the vector bundle. You can make coefficients in a vector bundle. So that's the integer. So if you want to know whether your, a certain cohomology class is appropriate, you just see if it satisfies these integrality conditions, then there is a bundle, and these integers become the, Dirac, the indices of Dirac operators with coefficients in the bundle. So that's the answer. Yes. So it couldn't be any nicer, huh? Yes, from the beginning. What? Every form from the beginning can then what? Arbitrary form from the beginning. Then you have to test it on every closed manifold mapping in, and you have to get an integer. It's a necessary condition and it's sufficient. So that's the statement. You can never forget it. I mean what is C in the Huh? What is C? It was not C is the the arbitrary form that you want to see is it a churn character. So you have a you have a arbitrary base. You want, is there a bundle up here that rep so that this form becomes the churn character form? So you take every 
manifold mapping in, closed manifold, you pull back, you see whether it satisfies the integrality condition, which it would. See, if, if the bundle was there, you could pull back the bundle, form the Dirac operator with coefficients, and then that formula gives an integer. So it's necessary. So the statement is it's sufficient. Okay, now, I don't know who to attribute this theorem to. Uh, I'll, I'll put down a few names. Stong, Hattori, and maybe myself, because I knew the theorem, and when I looked it up, I couldn't find it anywhere. So, anyway, it follows from some other information uh, that one had in the 60s about topology. Anyway, and it's, uh, we have a paper in Jeff Cheeger's memorial volume where we state this theorem. Okay, all right, so that's the, uh, and, and now, now there's another wonderful theorem Besides the Atiyah-Singer index theorem, there's the atiyah patodi singer theorem. Now, this is the early 70s. See, this, is, this theorem here is like early 60s. See, and this is less than 1960. The integrality was known, and they were finding, hey, if it's an integer, it must be the index of an operator. Well, that's how they... Uh, uh, and this is atiyah patodi singer Atiyah, Singer, and then Patodi. And this is when you have a manifold with boundary. And I remember watching Atiyah talk about this theorem. He would write down a formula, and he would say this term is analysis, this term is differential geometry, this term is topology, and they add up to zero. So, you know, Atiyah likes to sweep, you know. So the topology term, well, if you were doing the appropriate Ordinary manifold without the additional structure would be the uh, signature. That would be, that would be an integer. Otherwise, if you're doing uh, one of these others, it's like the holomorphic Euler characteristic or the um, um, arithmetic genus or the, uh, the, it's called the A hat genus, but it means the dimension of harmonic spinners, either real or complex. Anyway, there's some integer here and if, when you have boundary, you have to put boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are kind of subtle. But anyway, this integer measures some natural thing like that. And then the differential geometric thing, this is some integer. And I'm going to be reducing mod 1, so I don't emphasize this integer anymore. Although the fact that there is an integer there is crucial. The differential geometric thing is, the, this is the term you integrate over m. You integrate this expression, which might be an integer. You integrate this over, let's call this, let's call this W now. Let's use W when you have boundary. So you integrate this thing, that gives a real number. When it's a closed manifold, it gives an integer. But over, it gives a partial integer, or a real number. So that's what you put here. And here you put the integer, which is, has some sort of topological condition. It's the index of some operator with boundary conditions. And then the analysis is, we have an odd dimensional manifold here. When you, uh, you look at uh, the same operator sort of on the boundary, but now it's self-adjoint, so its signature is zero, and you look at something called the spectral flow, you look at the spectrum, it's self-adjoint, you make a zeta function, do analytic continuation. Anyway, you get a, you get a, a complicated number, and this is called the eta invariant. Eta invariant. Anyway, so these, this real number and this real number differ by an integer, which is given by topology. This is differential geometric integrated over here. This is a spectral invariant of boundary. This can be, if you don't know how this fills in, and you just give the differential geometry on the boundary, you can compute this number from spectral theory. But it's not really computable. Whereas this number is computable, and this number is an integer. So this number, so this number is computable mod 1, because it's just this integral reduced mod 1. Okay, so now uh, what we want to do, so th this is what we have as our machinery. We have uh, this integrality and, and these wonderful theorems here. And then there's another theorem, another thing we have is another, from topology, there's a notion of a homology theory. So first let me remind you that of this sort of uh, 
a fantastic theorem around 1950 of um, Steenrod and uh, Eilenberg, yeah, Eilenberg Steenrod, giving axioms for homology. So if you have a functor which for um, which is uh, into a gradient of space into gradient abelian groups, which um, if you vary if maps by homotopy, the induced transformations are the same. Um, you have the excision, you have it defined for pairs, there's the excision isomorphism, you have the long exact sequence of a pair. That's they have three axioms. So let's call them uh, homotopy, excision, and exactness. And then you have the, <coughs> the statement that the homology groups of a point are concentrated in degree zero. Then those four axioms uniquely characterize the functor. So our theorem that Jim talked about yesterday is a motive, you know, was sort of just trying to do an analog of that for differential, ordinary differential cohomology. Then a generalized homology theory is where you only have the first three axioms, you don't have the axioms of a point. Okay, and now <coughs> this, uh, so that's the definition of a homology theory in general. And Whitehead gave a, a representation theorem which is very useful, so you can represent this in terms of homotopy theory, stable homotopy theory. Uh, and, but now the, um, it's not unique. In other words, the groups of a point don't determine so K theory, and then Bott's periodicity theorem gives an example of this. So that gave the first serious example of a generalized homology theory. Uh, Tom's work, Bordism theory, gave other examples. So there are lots of uh, interesting examples of generalized homology theories. They satisfy the same axioms except the groups of a point are different. And then the uh, uniqueness uh, theorem requires you to understand the theory of uh, what's what I call spectrum in stable homotopy theory. All right, so, but being a homology theory is uh, quite significant. In other words, there's things you can do. So for example, you can talk about homology with coefficients in anything. So the homology with coefficients can be defined because of this definition in terms of homotopy theory. So you can do that. So you can take coefficients and you have the Bockstein sequences and stuff like that. So you have this thing across the top for K-theory. That just follows from being a homology theory and Whitehead's representation theory. And then uh, you can build homology theories out of other ones. So for example, if you take if you look at this theorem here, there's a natural product structure. If you take one of these problems and cross it with another closed manifold, so you take V mapping to a point, M mapping into X, and you take the product mapping into a point cross X, which is still X. So there's a natural module structure. You can multiply these elements by closed manifolds mapping to a point. Then, uh, because of the multiplicative property of this guy, and the fact that there's nothing mapping to point, this number will just multiply by the Todd genus of V. If you replace, if you compute this number and then do this and compute this number, it just differs by multiplication by the Todd genus of V. So I'm going to call that the product formula, the obvious product formula. <coughs> now, you can say, well, so there's a, this is the notation we use for these things, if we consider these maps here, closed manifolds mapping into X, and then we took, uh, this would be M1 and M2, and all this is mapping into X, and this is again a manifold, and if, this stable, if the almost complex structure that you have here and here extends over the middle, then we say these two cycles are homologous in the Bordism theory. Okay? This is like homology theory. And when we take homology classes, we get a homology theory. I put the star down here. This is a bordism, complex bordism of X. Okay. So this is a homology theory, and, or, and this is a cohomology theory. And then uh, there's another surprise. 
coming from topology, which is due to Connor and Floyd. Uh, I use this a lot in my thesis work and stuff. And it's nice in those days to be in Princeton because then they came by and gave lectures because in those days you didn't, uh, papers didn't appear on the internet. You know, there were preprints maybe, and then it took a year before they were published, and so I was lucky to, so I got, I got in on this before this was even published. Anyway, they proved something that was quite remarkable. In fact, I still hardly believe it. it you can mod out by this action here. You can mod out, if you multiply, see this is an action on the boardism. You can cross with V, mapping to a point. And this is a, a, a module structure over this ring. And uh, then you can collapse under, the, under this Todd genus homomorphism. So you, you can cross with V here and then identify that to the Todd genus times Todd genus of V times that. So uh, let's see, this is over the bordism of a point. And this module structure is the Todd genus. This is a ring homomorphism. So the Todd genus is this, it's like holomorphic Euler characteristic. It's multiplicative map. So what I'm doing is, what you're doing is you're, 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 you're saying M, M, F, ah. You're saying this, suppose you cross with something whose Todd genus is zero, you're setting this equal to zero. If Todd V equals zero. You're adding these relations. So if you cross with CP1, the Todd genus of the sphere is one, and that doesn't change the element. So this is, I, sometimes this is called the periodicity relations. And now, if you consider this thing, this is a homology theory. It satisfies these three axioms, uh, homotopy, excision, and exactness. Well, if you do any algebraic construction to a homotopy functor, you're going to get a homotopy functor. If you do any algebraic construction to something where there's an isomorphism, excision, you're going to get an isomorphism. But if you tensor an exact sequence with a module like this, you're not going to get an exact sequence. There's this idea of a flat module, which essentially means it's essentially free after you localize it. These modules are super non-free and super complicated. And Connor Floyd proved these, this functor still satisfies the exactness. This is the homology theory. So this is a surprise. So this is something, if you knew enough, you would say this is impossible to happen, but it happens. So, so everything that, subsequently now, uh, everything that follows now is basically just going to be standard work using this beautiful integrality stuff and this stuff, this fact here, everything else. And in fact, what they do, they actually go on to prove that this theory, if you look at the groups of a point, it just z, 0, z, 0, z, 0, z, it runs down to minus infinity because you've collapsed all the bordism down to this one z. And in fact, this homology theory uh, is the dual homology theory to K theory. That's also what they prove. So now we have, so um, let me just back up a second. I remember, uh, before I started working with Jim, a few years before we started working together, uh, we were in Manhattan at some dinner for IHES and Maxime Kinsevich was there. And uh, then we were walking afterwards home and then Jim joined us, we were walking along. We walked him home and we were talking about math and stuff. And Jim was asking uh, us, uh, what can you say about a vector bundle if all the characteristic forms vanish? But not just the characteristic classes, but the characteristic forms. So, anyway, so that's an interesting question. Uh, or, you know, what can you say when two vector bundles with, I mean, what can you say about a, a, actually, what can you say about a connection if the characteristic forms vanish? And so, uh, you could also say, well, what can you say about two bundles with connections if their characteristic forms are equal? You know, how, how are they related? And then I remember Kinsevich pointed out 
Well, of course, we know uh, if you say the curvature is, is that what is that how, is that what you call the yeah this is what you usually call the the uh, the, the curvature. I'm also calling it this. <laughs> this what R maybe R R yeah okay R. Well, we know when the curvature is zero, that means it's a flat bundle and given by representation. And then I think Kinsevich pointed out that this makes sense too. This has invariant meaning, so you can talk about. That. So anyway, there are various kinds of things. So we know what this means, we don't know what this means, and we also didn't know what it meant for the characteristic forms to be zero. So these, you know, can look at it and so on. And so this theory actually gives, an, it, it, uh, it does two things actually. It gives sort of an answer to that question. Namely, you take these structured bundles and you refine them by finitely many degrees of freedom. That was this question we had, the person who was there talking. Uh, it's not quite the same as having the characteristic forms equal, but it's a finite dimensional refinement. And then you make a theory out of that. And so that's, in a way, looking at this question. What does it mean when two things are equal? And then so it fits into a diagram like this, which is now becomes part of a generalized notion of cohomology theory called differential cohomology theory. So it also gives, uh, so this simultaneously gives a representation for something that is interesting, differential K-theory, and at this, that's what Jim's talk was, and it also answers, in a, in a sense, this question, characteristic forms are equal, or a little finite dimensional refinement means that it's a functor which differs from K-theory by this, or differs from this other kind of K-theory by this, and so on. Okay, so now, this business here, with all this integrality, and this sort of miracle of Connor Floyd, that you have a homology theory here because exactness should not hold here, but it does. Um, uh, will allow us to give a second geometric representation of this. And that's what we're going to. And that's. And let me just quickly outline what. And then, <clears throat> and then there's a problem that uh, I've been hearing about for a few years, but. About eight years ago, Singer was working on it, and Freed and Lot, Dan Freed and uh, what's Lot's first name? Lot? Oh, huh? John. John Lot, right. Uh, and Bunke and Schick, Thomas Schick in G Germany were working on this. And uh, there's another development in the index theory, which is called the families index theorem, which is quite interesting when you do it for families. And then you wanted to have a families index theorem for differential K-theory. So that, so let me just, so okay, so, so then, now yesterday, Jim was talking about um, what he called differential characters. These were functions on cycles to the circle. But now we're gonna talk about not just singular cycles, but s smooth manifold cycles. So these are gonna be odd dimensional smooth manifold cycles, and they're structured by uh, either this or this. I'm not gonna discuss this today. This involves getting into other kinds of K-theory. So let's take this out now. Uh, and so a, uh, a K-character by definition, uh, a K-character on X, say X is some big manifold, so here's, here's x, and just like here, if we want to see whether something can be uh, the characteristic form of a bundle over x, we have to probe it by mapping manifolds into x. So here we're going to probe, but, but here we map in even manifolds, but here we're going to map in odd manifolds odd manifolds mapping into X, and they should be structured. So they have to be provided with, on their stable tangent bundles, uh, an almost complex structure or a spin C structure, which I haven't defined yet, and they should also be provided with a connection. Then, so you have such a thing, and then to any such thing, you have to give a number in R mod Z. And it has to satisfy two properties, that whenever the odd thing is um, 
the boundary of something, this number, there's some differential form, C on X. And so this, the function phi, or maybe call it F, like yesterday, there's a C sub F on X, so that this number, uh, let's call this, let's see, odd M W. So this first property says that F of M in R mod Z is equal to the integral over W of this partial quantity uh, C, F star of E, C times Todd W integrated over W mod Z. So <clears throat> you could sort of say, you could express this sort of differently. You could say if you had an M1 and an M2, you got two numbers. The difference between these two numbers is given by integrating the characteristic form over the interior. That's so um, that's one property. And then the other property is if you cross this cycle with an even dimensional guy in a point, then it should, the number should just be given by multiplying the number in R mod Z by the Todd genus of V. Okay, that's the, that's what a K character is. So it satisfies a variation property. When it varies, it varies by this differential geometric term. Now because of this theorem, well, okay, you cannot, if you're, if you're perfectly intelligent or something and absorbing all this perfectly, you would say, oh, this theorem means you can rewrite what I said in terms of the eight invariant, but forget that now. Uh, uh, question about notation. Uh, your integral is over uh, W, Yeah, right? that's but, a good point. Yeah, but there's no W uh, uh, on the Labert, uh, right? <coughs> Yeah, there is. Ah, okay. Good. Thank you. And, and also here. I had it here. Okay, now I put it. Yeah. And, but you did say something. I'm supposing that the structure here extends over W. But you can always do that. If, so that, that means the, uh, uh, the structure extends, so. The geometric structure extends. Let's see. Yeah, so this has a geometric structure like a, a, a connection on a bundle. The bundle extends, uh, the connection extends, and so on. So you take some extended structure. Okay, so this is the definition of K character. So it's a, again, it, it's, a, it's a numerical quantity that you compute. And you don't need this W if you use this theorem because this is an integer, this is what I'm saying it's equal to, but this is also equal to that. So you could actually sort of say that this number, uh, when this bounds, is given as the eta invariant of, of the boundary. Okay. All right, so this is, so this is a little more complicated definition than a, a cycle that Jim gave yesterday. But, but the statement is that you can put, you can put uh, k characters here. So the set, of, the set of k characters, these functions over x is isomorphic to k hat, to structured bundles. So that's the main theorem, okay? And now all these maps are quite non-trivial. Well, you have to get the isomorphism. Uh, let's see, there's a, there's a replacement for this one. This is k upper odd. Uh, yeah, this is another thing. I give tribute to the Russian mathematics since we toasted that last night at the dinner. This is a special ax I like to grind. Pontryagin duality says ordinary homology with coefficients in some locally compact abelian group is cohomology 
with coefficients in the Pontryagin dual group and the Pontryagin dual, so the Pontryagin dual of homology with coefficients in some locally compact group like the integers or something is actually the cohomology with coefficients in the Pontryagin dual group. Now, in Princeton, which is the center of topology, you don't learn this theorem. You learn things like, uh, so for, here's an example. Take G to be a finite group, you know, Z mod 16. Then the Pontryagin dual is Z mod 16. And so this gives you the fact that homology with coefficients in Z mod 16 is dual to cohomology. Pontryag, they're Pontryagin dual. In Princeton, you learn with field coefficients, they're dual. But Z mod 16 is not a field. Z mod 2 is a field. And I, I was struggling with these Z mod 8 classes, and I said, what is a Z mod 8 cohomology class? And so, anyway, from Pontryagin duality, you, you, you get it. Uh, and, and, and it turns out, miraculously, the same thing is true with K-theory. So it turns out you can prove complex K-theory satisfies Pontryagin duality. And now, this, uh, this functor here is given by this functor. And remember I said you could take coefficients when you have a homology theory. So that's, so you jam all of that into this uh, business to get this map into K theory. So this is really the, and, and the, the group that appears here is HOM. Uh, now I'm going to switch from C to R, so I don't, actually I want to, uh, uh, I'm going to work with unitary connections. And there's, there's an, a T of Singer version here, the R. And then this is HOM of um, something into R mod Z. So I, I replace C mod Z by R mod Z. Okay. And this something here is this, let me call this functor here. I put a bar, which means I collapse by these relations here. But this is also related to K theory. So this is Hom Bordism bar with Z coefficients in the Harmon Z. So Pontryagin duality says if you put the integers here, you get the circle here. The Pontryagin dual of the integers is the circle. Pontryagin dual of the circle is the integers, right? So when you put integers here and take Hom into the circle, Pontryagin dual means hom into the circle. This is, this is, g hat means this. So we're using Pontryagin duality, which is true for homology, that's classical, and in the 60s we found out that it was also true for complex K theory. And then that's how you actually use, that's how you prove this theorem uh, that this is a sufficient condition. You use this Pontryagin duality for K-theory, which we used in surgery theory uh, to do, calculate the classifying space for this is surgery theory. Anyway, so, so uh, this, by Pontryagin duality for K-theory, I can replace the K-theory with coefficients in R mod Z by the Pontryagin dual thing, which is the homology, so I can put that there. And then these, K, so these are the K characters. So the K characters are functions from cycles into R mod Z. And then this map here is you take the form which uh, gives you the variation. So given any K character, you're supposed to have a form so you integrate this to get the value when it's a boundary. That's this map here. And now you see it goes into those forms, and I'm supposing it goes into those forms that satisfy the integrality theorem. And then that means that this will be well defined. All right, the integrality theorem is all you need for this to be well for this um, this to be well defined. See. Uh, See, uh, yeah, I should say, there's something implicit in this is that if you took another thing, W prime, if this is going to be true, then that means the integral of this plus the integral of this should be an integer. Because the, the integral here is equal to this fraction and the integral here is equal to this fraction, so the sum of the two has to be an integer. So you have to be in this integrality situation. 
And so I'm replacing this, the GL thing here, by the thing that satisfied the integrality conditions. I should call them the uh, Adams, Bott, Milner, but now just it's easier. Since new generation has heard of the Tia Singer index theorem, it doesn't know about Adams, Bott, Milner. We'll call it the Atiyah Singer Index Theorem Conditions, okay? Everyone's heard of the Atiyah Singer Index Theorem. Yeah, but it's also one of the paths. What, what, what? It is easier, but it is not maybe so honest. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In this country, you worry about that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, it's also... I would say, no, it's also correct because, see, the meaning of the integrality theorem, see, that's what Singer said. What does this integrality theorem mean? It must mean there's an operator. So, the meaning of the theorem is the Atiyah-Singer index theorem. Okay, so it's okay to call it that. So, you, I'm slowly changing the diagram. First, I put in k characters, and I'm, I sort of said this is an isomorphism, but the proof involves sort of substituting in and invoking these theorems. So I substitute in for GL the Atiyah-Singer conditions because that will be defined then, but they're the same because of this wonderful Pontryagin duality. And then Pontryagin duality here means I can replace this curious thing with R mod Z by this HOM, by Pontryagin duality, by HOM of the homology into R mod Z. And then this is just still ordinary. All of this is, is ordinary. And uh, and that's it, that's it, that's it. Those are the ideas. So, the integrality, this amazing fact of Connor Floyd that this is a homology theory, the fact that Pontryagin duality holds for K-theory, and then you can get a new diagram here, and then you get a new diagram where this is K characters, but this is the same as before, this is the same as before, and this is the same as, and so by the five lemma, this is the same as before. Right? Everything, if I, can, if I make sense of all this, I'm, I'm done. And so now we have a second, uh, we're sort of, it's like Pontryagin duality for K characters. It's saying you take HOM of certain cycles into R mod Z, and that gives you the uh, differential K theory, which is defined by vector bundles with connections. So what it means, Geometrically, is there's a set of numerical invariants. If you have a bundle with connection, then, and another bundle with connection over the same space, are they equivalent up to adding trivial bundles and the trivial connection? Are they isomorphic bundles so that the connections, when you move them over, are churn simons equivalent, same structured bundles? That's if and only if you compute all these numbers. You map odd manifolds into the base, compute these numbers and they should be the same. So it's a set of numerical invariants that tells you when two elements here are the same. So there's things you can compute. And then this also gives a set of numerical invariants for K-theory. See, the characteristic classes, even the integral ones, do not determine a vector bundle. But you can use these numerical invariants to rig up some rational invariants for here, I won't go into that now because of time, but it's just a little manipulation with manifolds, manifolds, boundary, and you can rig up a bunch of numerical invariants for elements in K-theory, and uh, they're, they're boardism invariants, and that's really how you prove this Pontryagin duality. So, see, Pontryagin duality says that when you have a cohomology class, it's equal to the Pontryagin dual of some homologies. That means it's HOM into R mod Z, and now I'm going to take R mod Z contains Q mod Z, which is the direct limit of the Z mod Ns. So what you do is you construct a bunch of mod N invariants here, numerical invariants that determine that. Now this was already known in the 60s, but this gives a new proof of it. In fact, you have to give a new proof of this compatible with this discussion to prove this theorem to you have the five lemma. Okay, so you can sort of summarize this by saying, uh, this second part is, I'm asserting that differential K-theory, which is defined by vector bundles with connection, uh, has a Pontryagin dual description as HOM of a bunch of cycles into R mod Z. And then, oh yeah, right, so I shouldn't, uh, right, so I could stop. Uh, five minutes, should I stop? Five minutes or stop? Five minutes. All right, fine.
right. Right, so actually we did this, we started doing this about three or four years ago. How many years ago? Maybe five. Five, yeah. So we got this far about three years ago, I guess. And then the next part is caused a two year delay. And you were supposed to mention that in your talk, but you didn't get around to it. Or you could have mentioned it. But anyway, I'll so, um, so this problem, so the, the idea is to get a family's index theorem. So, so, uh, so suppose you have a family, S, and on the fiber you have like, you know, complex manifolds. These are even dimensional manifolds. Even dimensional, say, complex manifolds or almost complex manifolds. Then, see, if you have this odd thing in the base, this structure on which you can compute this numerical invariant that determines this guy. You could take the pre-image here and consider the thing over it. You consider the, this family over this thing, right? And this is again an odd manifold. And so you have a map from odd structured cycles here to odd structured cycles here. Although I should be a little more careful. I need to have a spin C, I need to have uh, this additional geometric structure. So you have to have a connection on the bundle, so it should be a Riemannian submersion, and there's something about spin C, which I won't have time to talk about. Spin C is what you need to define the operator in order to define this integer in terms of an operator. That's all I'll say about that. But anyway, there's, so there's a natural map this way on cycles. Just take the pre-image. Odd cycles and odd cycles. So then there's a natural map this way on characters. They're functions on cycles. And, but that's the same as differential K-theory. So there's a wrong way map from differential K-theory here to differential K-theory here. That's called the push forward or push down. So we got a wrong way map. And then the family's index theorem in ordinary K-theory is a compu an analytic computation of that push down. That's the family's index theorem. So you want to have an analytic computation. And I believe Freed and uh, uh, Greg Moore and people like that want to construct some, I don't know what it is, it's something called self-dual quantum field theory or something. And they actually want something even slightly more precise than this. But let's say for now we're going to do that. They not only want the structured bundle, but they want the actual bundle and the actual connection. I don't know, for, in, in a push down situation. Now there's, I should say, the other people working on this are several teams. They do something different than what I'm going to describe quickly now. They actually look at each point, they look at the fiber, and they look at the L2 space of spinners on the fiber, and then they do uh, take the uh, uh, Dirac operator, and then as the point varies, they get an element in K theory, and they actually get a connection, and that's their push down. And, but then it's, it's extremely complicated. There's a paper by Frieden Lott. This is going to be a, sort of a, a, simple, a, a poor man's approach. So we're not going to localize down to points. We're going to localize down to all the probing cycles, which are enough to determine the object. So we have this map on cycles. We have this map down like this. Do and eventually, do you have eventually a nice theory of pushovers? Huh? A nice theory of pushovers in uh, what? the context of a nice pushovers. Theory. A nice what of? Theory. Theory. Of pushovers. Of pushdown. Yeah. Push down. Push I don't know what it means to have a nice theory. I have a definition of a pushdown. It's na completely nat natural. So. Uh, does it uh, consistent with uh, composition? Composition of what? I think he's saying this is of a nice bundles. theory of pushdown. No, he's asking. I don't know the meaning of your question, but I bet I could prove whatever, whatever property I could understand in a, in a, in a, in a couple of years, maybe. Okay. <laughs> because this is extremely, this is so natural, it's just, you want to get a cycle here, I want to get a cycle here, I just take the pre-image, okay? And um, so then you get, by Pontryagin duality, Hom and Dharma Z, you get a pushdown map in differential K-theory, and now we want to compute it analytically. So for two years, we were struggling or more with the fact that these vibrations are not so trivial. 
uh, Riemannian vibrations. You've got several connections here. First of all, if you have a Riemannian connection here, you can pull it up and get a natural connection on the horizontal subspace. And then if you give yourself the Riemannian connection on the fiber, the fibers are all Riemannian too, so you have Riemannian connection. And you can take the direct sum connection. That's one connection you can take. And, and it turns out the push down, when you look at the geometric structure, you have it here and you do it here and you want to actually prove this is a well-defined map on K characters. It turns out you've got to get this product formula and so you're forced to use, you're forced to endow this cycle with the direct sum connection to make the product formula work. And then you get a push down. So I'm sort of cheating. At first sight, it looks like it's obvious, but when you structure this thing to get the product formula, you have to use the direct sum connection. Now, the Atiyah Patodi Singer theorem uses the Riemannian connection, or Bismuth made some generalizations to large connections with non zero torsion, but the product connection does not satisfy those Bismuth condi conditions. So we worried about that for about a year. And uh, so then it turns out there's this wonderful thing that the physicists told to the mathematicians, and I think the mathematicians like Chuger and Bismuth had been using it for a long time, and eventually that some of that knowledge trickled down to us. And then Jim finally made a certain computation, which I'll mention in a minute, and then everything works beautifully. So let me just state what happened. So there's something called the, uh, uh, well, you can do the following thing. You want to use, you're forced to use the direct sum connection, but you would like to use the Riemannian connection up here. See, there's a natural Riemannian metric. You have the Riemannian metric here, the Riemannian metric on the fiber. You take the direct sum Riemannian metric, make it orthogonal. But the levi chivita connection is not the direct sum of the two connections. There's a difference, there's a twisting. But it turns out that it would, it, would, it would be great if the Riemannian connection were churn simons equivalent to the direct sum connection, but it's not. If it were, then I could proceed happily, but it's not. But it turns out you can do one of two things. You make the fiber extremely short, or you make the base extremely long and keep the fiber fixed. You do either one. These are scaly equivalent. The levi chivita connection is scale invariant. If you multiply the metric by 1,000, it's the same connection. You don't change the connection. So, if you start scaling here, you don't change the levi chivita connection here. And then you look at this, and you look at the Riemannian connection up here as the base goes to infinity. It turns out there is a limiting connection. It's not a Riemann, it's not, doesn't preserve the metric, but it, there's a limiting connection. And it turns out the limiting connection, the limit connection, is churn simons equivalent to the, to the direct sum connection, which we use in the definition of push forward. So that means you've got a theorem. This is the family's index theorem for differential K theory. So this is why we've had this delay. We started this four or five years ago. And and kind of, I guess about in the last year, we've understood how to finish this. So we get a family's index theorem is that the, um, the K character or differential K theory push down uh, is computed analytically So this object is determined by these numerical invariants. So we take one cycle, we push it down, we take one cycle in here, we want to compute this number. So, um, this number is, we take the pre-image up here, we have these, the push down is computed with this connection on the pre-image. But we could also use the limit of the Riemannian connections by this, this is called the adiabatic limit. And so each one of these 
because of the atiyah patodi singer theorem, this, this, uh, this, this, because of this property, we can compute all the values in terms of things that bound. Uh, there's a little detail here which I'm skipping, but that's, it, we, can, we can reduce the problem to things that bound. And then this is given by this differential geometric term by definition because of the property. But then uh, this is defined differential geometrically with the direct sum connection as a geometric structure. But by this chern simons equivalent, we can replace the direct sum connection by the limit of the Riemannian connections. With the Riemannian connection, we have the atiyah patodi singer theorem, which says up to an integer, it's equal to this eta invariant. And so we can write that is computed analytically as the limit of eta of, of the object of the cycle pulled up, endowed with its Riemannian connection, uh, as we take the adiabatic limit. So, so that's a, um, a theorem that says something defined differential geometrically or kind of topologically can be computed analytically. And that's the way one could think of the family's index theorem. So that, uh, that's an analytic calculation of the pushdown. So, that's the end. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, Dennis and Jim are leaving today, so let's thank them for beautiful lectures. Yeah, hey. Thank you. So I've been planning how to make my wife not jealous, or might have wanted to come here, so I'm going to say uh, St. Petersburg is as charming as uh, Amsterdam, which he was at recently, because it has all these canals and a nice building, and as serious and interesting as New York, which is not charming, but Jim doesn't like me to say, say that. So, <laughs> so thank you for inviting me. I've never been here before. Yeah.